evolving terrestrial ancestors that transitioned through several semi-aquatic and fully aquatic forms, leaving the hippopotamus and the ruminants of their nearest living relatives. And so the fossil record documenting this transition has made cetaceans quite wrong with macroevolution. But in recent years, cetaceans have also begun to enter something of a molecular evolutionary spotlight. And this is due in large part to increasing numbers of whole genome sequencing projects in which we're finding that cetaceans may be an ideal model for understanding the molecular foundations of major evolutionary transitions. Sensory systems have emerged as hotspots of molecular evolutionary change in cetaceans, and this includes my favorite protein, the visual pigments. So what is a visual pigment? Well, uh, rhodopsin is the visual pigment found in the rod photoreceptors, and together with the cones and the cone photoreceptors, they form the layer of the retina that's sensitive to light. Rhodopsin is a G-protein coupled receptor, a GPCR, and it's this little molecule bound inside the transmembrane helices, the retinal chromophore, that actually reacts to light. Rhodopsin itself is characterized by a very high light sensitivity or photosensitivity relative to the conopsins, making it critical for vision under dim light conditions. So much so that rods dominate the, motor, so dominate the retina in most, uh, most animal species. So rhodopsin's ability to activate depends very heavily on the incoming wavelengths of light. And in nature, we see remarkable variation in the wavelengths of peak opsin photosensitivity. And this is a phenomenon known as spectral tuning. Uh, in vitro biochemical work has shown that variation in spectral tuning is primarily accounted for by amino acid side chains that surround the retinal chromophore. And in a lot of these teleost fish lineages, we see uh, convergence in these substitutions that induce blue shifts in peak sensitivity. And this is because in the open ocean, um, light rapidly attenuates with depth and narrows onto the blue part of the spectrum. So ultimately, spectral tuning is thought to be a, a, an adaptive response to maximize photon capture in the dim blue shifted light environments found underwater. We also see blue shifts in cetacean rhodopsins uh, relative to terrestrial mammals, but it wasn't until a recent study from our group that this variation was linked explicitly to selection patterns in cetacean rhodopsin genes. So in this study, we showed positive selection in cetacean rhodopsins, as well as significant divergence along clade partitions defined by foraging depths. So these are the same clade models that Francis just talked about. And three sites in particular stood out in the study as having both high evolutionary rates and as following the guiding partitions. These were 83, 292, and 299. So in an older study, these three sites were actually mutated in an in vitro experiment using a bovine rhodopsin model, and it was found that they actually did impact spectral tuning. Uh, but we, in our study, made the same mutations in a cetacean rhodopsin background and found, in this case, actually, it was primarily only one site, the 292 site, that primarily accounted for the variation in spectral tuning and the blue shifts. And so now that these substitutions have been made in some other rhodopsin backgrounds, we're in fact seeing that these substitutions don't always have perfectly consistent effects across species. And generally, this speaks to a phenomenon that's become, that we're becoming more aware of now, that the same substitutions made in different genotypic backgrounds can sometimes have different phenotypic effects. And this is referred to as intramolecular epistasis. So in extreme cases, this can even sometimes result in opposing, opposing functional effects, and we call this sign epistasis. But in other cases, the effect may be non-additive but directionally consistent, and this is magnitude epistasis. More recent work on protein evolution is showing that intramolecular epistasis can have a huge impact on protein evolutionary trajectories by constraining the conditions under which a given substitution may be either beneficial or deleterious. And these interactions may also impact, uh, may have pleiotropic effects. They may actually influ influence multiple protein functions. So where Rhodopsin is concerned, it's only in recent years that people have started looking at non-spectral functions in a comparative and so this is primarily looking at kinetic functions in rhodopsins. So light absorption is just the first part of the activation process. And so what happens next is that when the chromophore absorbs light, it isomerizes to its all trans configuration, and this in turn triggers a conformational shift in the protein itself through several intermediate states, the active one, which is known as meta-2. And so this is the form that actually initiates the phototransduction cascade and hyperpolarization of the rod photoreceptor. After that, the little chromophore molecule leaves the binding pocket and migrates out of the protein. And so 
seminal study um, by Subramar and colleagues and actually found that the 83 substitution that we see in cetaceans as well as other teleops, and they, they did a mutation experiment in African cichlids, they found that the blue shifting substitution, M83, actually also shifts the equilibrium of intermediate states towards favoring the active form, beta 2. So they proposed that perhaps kinetic adjustments may also be adaptations that improve in life photosensitivity, perhaps in ways that have been underappreciated relative to spectral tuning. So we wanted to find out if perhaps kinetic functions may also be playing a role in the adaptation of cetacean rhodopsins to marine environments. And to take a first look at this basic question, we wanted to just ask, do cetaceans have different meta-2 kinetic properties relative to their nearest terrestrial F groups? And so we used the killer whale model from our previous study and compared it with rhodopsins from hippopotamus and bovine. We then also wanted to know what role these three sites may have on meta-2 kinetics in each of these backgrounds. Uh, one, because for some of these sites, even though they seem to have high evolutionary rates, they seem to have a, a small effect on spectral tuning. And we also were interested in perhaps some of these may have pleiotropic effects, affecting both spectral tuning and meta kinetics. So to do this, we first isolated the Rhodopsin coding sequences from these uh, three species, and um, we synthesized them to have restriction sites for insertion into an expression vector for mammalian cell transfection. We use basic site directed mutagenesis protocols to manipulate those three sites of interest. Uh, then after harvesting the rhodopsins and uh, purifying them with immune affinity methods, we subject the samples to functional assays. So to measure spectral tuning, we use an absorbent spectrophotometer to capture the um, spectral signature in the dark. But to look at meta-2 properties, what we do is we use a light activation fluorescent assay. And so how this works is that when the sample is exposed to light and the rhodopsin leaves the chromophore, this actually induces intrinsic fluorescent signals from unquenched tryptosin residues in the protein. And so this fluorescent signal is a proxy for the decay of the meta-2 state. And so you get a nice curve here, a time course, that then you can fit to a first order exponential um, equation and you get an estimate of the meta-2 half-life. So this is our second variable. So what we found for spectral tuning is that the killer whale doesn't need a blue shifted pigment, and this is uh, uh, congruent with what we've re reported previously, while the hippo and the bovine both have uh, spectral tuning of about 500 nanometers, which is typical of terrestrial vertebrates. However, for meta-2 half-life, we found that both the killer whale and the hippo had significantly greater meta-2 half-lives than the bovine. And so this suggests that the basic output comparison that suggests that while blue shifts may be a derived trait in cetaceans, a longer meta-2 half-life may be an ancestral trait. So next, we wanted to see what substitutions of those three sites do to both of these functions. And for sites 292 and 299, we find that we see relatively consistent shifts for both functions in each species. Um, for site 292 in particular, we seem to see some pleiotropic effects with effects on both meta-2 half-life and spectral tuning. But it was really site 83 that was the most interesting. And so what we find here is that site 83, when we make the substitution in the killer whale background, there's actually no significant difference between the wild type and the mutant. But when we do the opposite mutation in the bovine, we do, we do see a significant shift in the half-life, about 12 minutes. And so for the most part, other studies that have done this mutation in different species backgrounds, this is what we see. We see a large shift. And so this lack of effect in killer whale is actually very surprising. Ultimately, this is an example of magnitude of the state. So we were curious if perhaps the differing residues at the other sites may be accounting for this epithet site interaction. So what we did is we tested again for this interaction effect while controlling for these two sites using mutation. So first, when both species have the bovine residue at site 292, we still see the epistatic interaction. So that suggests that the killer whale serine substitution at 292 isn't responsible for the epistatic effect of site 83. But when both species have the, res the bovine residue at site 299, all of a sudden we actually see a comparable shift from site 83 in both species. So this suggests that the killer whale serine substitution is at least in part responsible for this epistatic effect here. And I say in part because while we were able to induce a shift 
in the bovine, sorry, the killer whale or dachshund, we weren't able to knock out the effect of bovine using these residues. So that suggests there's still other sites um, that are impacting these mechanisms that we haven't yet identified. So to get a better idea of what's going on mechanistically here, we took a look at the bovine Medici crystal structure. So we're very lucky that there's a lot of crystal structures out there for Rodopsin, um, including for the active state. And what you'll notice here is that the T83 residue in the bovine, the side chain, is very close to the main chain of site 299. Now, in the biochemical literature, D83 is known to have a very critical um, participation in a network of hydrogen bonds throughout the trans membrane helices. And it's these bonds that actually mediate the conformational shifts between the protein star and active state. And so what we did is we took the um, uh, bovine metatu crystal structure and use it as a template to build a homology model of the killer whale metatu. And so here, the N83 substitution, um, perhaps maybe adding some extra hydrogen donors here that will allow the formation of a hydrogen bond with the main chain of site 299. Additionally, the same thing is happening with the serine residue with the, the hydroxyl group that's introduced here that may then make a bond with the main chain of site 296, which is actually bound to the resin chromophore. So both of these additions here may be helping to stabilize the meta-2 conformation, accounting for the longer meta-2 half-life that we found. Um, they may also be partly compensating for each other, um, but having a non-additive effect overall, so perhaps partly responsible for the epistasis that we saw. So just to summarize the results we have so far, um, but we found that even though the killer whale had a blue shifted um, spectral pigment, spectral rhodopsin pigment, both the hippo and the bovine, sorry, both the hippo and the whale had longer meta 2 half lives. So this suggests that while blue shifts may be a derived trait in cetaceans, um, slower meta 2 kinetics may in fact be ancestral. And so this difference in meta 2 half life seems to be primarily because of the site 83 residue and an epistatic interaction with site 299. And so for now, our working hypothesis is that the evolution of these three sites reflect trade-offs between spectral and non-spectral functions, where perhaps selection for blue shift substitution origins of site 292 necessitated compensating mutations um, to maintain ancestral kinetic traits. If we had the eutropic effect of 292, perhaps we need 83 to compensate for that, and perhaps even 299 makes that fine-tuning possible. So to test a lot of these ideas, we have some more experiments planned and also more evolutionary rates analyses looking specifically at cetacean and cetardiodactyl ancestral sequences. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there's also, as Francis mentioned, further uh, work from our lab on display today, uh, another talk in the afternoon, as well as a couple of posters. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. Yes, yeah, so actually those three sites, there is variation in other cetacean species. So, yes, yeah, and so um, we can make some inferences about what we think the functions are doing in different cetacean groups, but as I demonstrated,